So prostaglandins, in this case, their job is to help thin the cervical mucus. Now, when you thin the cervical mucus, that's a smart thing because that's another barrier the sperm are gonna have to try and get through. Here's the other cool thing is that prostaglandins are going to cause the cervix to actually do some reverse peristalsis. So not only when you deposit this in there, you've with your prostaglandins, you're thinning it out. So making it easier to get through the cervix and the cervix itself is doing this reverse peristalsis and pulling up the semen into the uterus. Wow. Okay, it's, it's quite the conspiracy. No wonder people get pregnant when they weren't planning on it. Okay, the uterine tubes, the uterus, everybody is now gonna draw this semen up because of prostaglandins. Hmm, an amazing molecule, does so many different things depending on where you are. Okay, prostate gland. The prostate gland is surrounding your, the urethra. That's a big deal for men, okay? It causes problems later. So. It is a milky solution. It's about um, 33, about a third, I guess, of the actual ejaculate. And it has antibiotic. It has seminal plasma. Okay, so the way I think of this is, is, you know, ladies, you got this protection plan, right? You've got an acidic vagina, so bacteria don't like it. You got dendritic cells right underneath the mucosa. They're ready if anybody tries to get in. And let's face it, anytime you have intercourse, there's always going to be a little bit of breaking of the mucosa. So you can get a little bit of bleeding. So thank goodness for the um, thank goodness for the dendritic cells underneath there, the malt, right? Mucosa associated lymphatic tissue. So all that's good. But then this big bolus of alkaline stuff comes in there. But it does come in, and I kind of think of it almost as like saying, I know I really screwed everything up, but here's some chocolates. Because seminal plasmin is that, I'm sorry, I ruined everything, but here's an antibiotic. Okay, because seminal plasmin is an antibiotic, All right? Okay, everybody okay with the glands? All right, so... When ejaculation occurs and it pulls up from the epididymis, you've got a grand total of about two to five mils. That's it, okay, not a lot. The pH should be on the alkaline side, so probably about 7.2 to 7.6. There are probably about 100 million sperm in that ejaculate. Numbers are a very important way to overcome the fact that most of them are probably just going to dribble right back out. They don't even get to go anywhere. They'll die on the acid walls of the vagina, they'll get eaten by the dendritic cells. There are a lot of things that are stacking up against these sperm. All right. So the seminal fluid from the accessory glands is in there, and we've got enzymes. So we've got a, we've got proteases. Proteases help to clear through the mucus that ha has been thinned out by the prostaglandin. So we've got proteolytic enzymes to break down the mucus, make it easier to get in. Um, we've got clotting factors. Here's an interesting thing. Now, for those of you who have access to this stuff, guys, you can make your own. Girls, depends on what kind of relationship you have. But if you get the opportunity, this is pretty cool to do. Get some ejaculate however you want to get it, but you need to get some where you can watch it, okay? This stuff is really sticky. So first, when it comes out, it sticks. Think about it. It's supposed to slam up against a cervix, right? It's supposed to stick there because a lot's going to try and dribble out. So it sticks. However, if it stayed in a cohesive, clotty glob, how could the sperm get out? Well, they couldn't. So built into this, are the this clotting factors that held it together, we have proteolytic enzymes that are going to break down the fibrin that held it as a clot. So it thins out the mucus, eats our way through, but it also allows the sperm to go free. So here's what you could see if you actually got some and watched it. So it starts out as this kind of, it's a creamy white glob.
But if you watch it over time, it's going to turn into a clear liquid. And that's how the sperm get loose. I know, next party conversation, right? You can't wait to share this with other people. Say, guess what I learned in class today? There won't be any parties unless you're doing it by Zoom. So, <laughs> all right. Penises. Let's talk about the penis. So when you look at a penis, it's got a root. The root, let me get to the actual penis picture here. Let's get to the whole thing. There we go. The root, the root of the penis is the part that's at the base. We've got the, with these parts, we're actually connecting the um, root is connected to the rami of the ischium. So they are actually anchored to bone. This is why if you have an erect penis, you can actually fracture it. If you were to hit very hard against an erect penis, you can actually break it. It's happened. I gather there was anger involved, but it is something to hold in the back of your mind. Both genders, it's a tool for defense. It's a watch out because somebody might know that tool for defense. All right, so the root is attached to the rami of the ischia. The body is the shaft of the penis. The glands is the expanded end. People call it the head of the penis. That's the glands penis, okay? The prepuce is the foreskin. This is what's removed during circumcision. If you are uncircumcised, this is where you will have in here, it pulls over the glands penis. It has to be retracted in order to clean around there. If you do um, indwelling catheter, fully catheter care, and somebody is uncircumcised, you have to pull that back, clean, then put it back over, okay? So um, the prepuce itself has these waxy glands. They're called prepucial glands. Here's another word I really like. They make this stuff called smegma. Uh, that's a great word, right? Smegma. So here's the thing to consider. A lot of um, cultural and religious practices do have a basis in health. And so this foreskin, if you don't circumcise a boy, what happens is while you're able to fully wash and, you know, child, <laughs> the Department of Child and Family Services won't be called because, you know, they're a teenager and you're pulling it back to wash it, but you need to pull it back and wash it. And you've got little boys who hit a certain age or men who are very casual in their hygiene. And what can happen is if you do not wash there and keep it clean, that smegma will grow bacteria. I took care of a patient one time who, bless his pointed 50-something-year-old head, he had not only had to have a transurethral prostatectomy, a TERP, where they snake a tube up here and rotor root out the, the uh, prostate because it's closing off the prostatic urethra. But this guy had also not had hygiene practices that were good. And so he had had to get circumcised in his 50s and they'd actually had to remove some of the glands because the infection was that bad. This was not a happy camper. All right, so the prepuce, the foreskin, really the original practices of removing it probably had their roots in the um, best practice for just hygiene because imagine, you know, the cleanliness thing. This is a good way to stay cleaner is really it. Okay, so now the erectile tissue. The penis is what we call the intromittent organ. So its job is to actually be able to go into the female's body, into the vagina. And it's made up of three columns of erectile tissue. It's this kind of vascular maze. It's got um, this elastic -y connective tissue and lots of space in it. And running up the center, are these arteries. So there are two corpora cavernosa. One is a corpus cavernosum and another corpus cavernosum. This is the corpus spongiosum. So I don't know about you, but this looks like a face to me. It actually looks like a gibbon monkey face very much if you know what a gibbon monkey looks like, but 
Um, so we've got these two big eyes, masks around the eyes here, the eyes in the center, here's the ooh mouth. All right, so when you look at a cross section of a penis, you're looking at these two guys here, the two corpora cavernosa and the corpus spongiosa running down the middle. The corpus spongiosum is what expands at the end to form the glans penis. Now, the entire reason for having these columns of spongy tissue is to allow for erection. And the way it works is that in a non-aroused state, this is just getting the basic blood flow. Okay, so the, these columns of spongy tissue, you've got the arterioles are basically constricted. You've just got a low blood flow. Just keep the tissue alive. Now, causes of arousal, of course, vary with the individual. It might be shoes. I don't know. It just depends upon the person, right? So the central nervous system, which is your brain, your thoughts, emotions. But really, when you get down to it, you can have an erection and you can ejaculate without having any feeling of it at all. A full spinal cord transection patient can ejaculate. Okay, so it is a spinal reflex. It's down the spinal cord down the sacral region is where this is going to occur. So what will happen is that during the process of arousal, the arteries vasodilate. So all these pudendal arteries relax and we start feeding more into these columns of erectile tissue. So these become engorged. And what happens when they get engorged is that they now compress the veins. So when you look at a cross section of the penis, you'll see that there are these dorsal veins. And as this fills, remember we're in a skin packet. And so there's only so much it can stretch. And what'll happen is these dorsal veins start getting compressed and they get compressed up against, oops, oops, okay. Up against the pubic bone. Because remember, this is how it's all set up, right? So as this gets filled, it presses up against the pubic bone, which then decreases the flow out of the veins, out of those dorsal veins. And now you're going to maintain an erection because you have vasodilated the arterioles coming in and you have compressed the venous return. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So then what will happen, and this is all actually weirdly enough, this is parasympathetic control. So then when you hit the climax, that's sympathetic nervous system. That's where the heart rate goes up, right? You, you start to sweat, uh, all that stuff. The blood pressure rises. This is when the guy who has heart problems is going to have the big MI and collapse on his hottie that he shouldn't have been with because he's way too old for that and shouldn't have run up the stairs in order to get to her in the first place because he was already in trouble. And then he goes, oh, and he dies. And then she's got to like... You know, this is one of those like bad movie things, scenes. I've seen it multiple times on the, you know, some show or another. It's like, oh, for the love of God, how cliche. But it happens. Okay. So anyway, if we get back to, let's get back to our penis. All right. So then what happens is you're going to get, once this is all filled up and this presses up against to close off that vein, then what you're going to end up with is peristaltic waves. And what they'll do is they're going to now pull from the epididymis and we're going to pull up with the peristaltic waves up the vas deferens down to the ampulla vas deferens, to the ejaculatory duct, to the prostatic, to the membranous, to the penile or spongy urethra and out the external urethral orifice, okay? So this is, the bulbospongiosis muscles, easy for me to say, of the penis are going to contract rapidly. And so for those who have access to see this happen, you'll see that there is, there's definitely a pulsation that goes on as this is occurring. And this is all when all those multiple physiological activities are happening, you know, your increase in heart rate, your blood pressure, the generalized muscle contraction, the 
feeling of intense pleasure, all that kind of good stuff. Okay. So is yeah. it going to be a sympathetic uh, yeah. nervous system uh, responsible for this part? Okay. That's right. The ejaculation is sympathetic. Vasodilation is weirdly enough parasympathetic. Because remember, when we think about blood vessels, we should always think sympathetic except here. This is that exception. Okay. So then what happens after ejaculation is you hit this latent period. And what that means is, yeah, we can't do that again, right? So depending upon your age, your health status, all that, how are you? Um, that can be minutes. It can be hours. Generally, the younger you are, the shorter the latent period. I don't think this is news to anybody in this. Um, so at, during that time, the arterioles are going to constrict and the penis becomes flaccid. So there's nothing more you can do about it at that point. All right, everybody good? So I've just taken some of the mystery out of the whole process of ejaculation, right? Okay, so now I wanna talk about meiosis. Now, your books, do a very nice job of compare and contrast of meiosis and mitosis. So this stuff starts over, this picture is over on page 1046. Okay, so we've backed up a little. And my reason for doing meiosis in the middle of guys and girls is because I wanted to talk about the boy parts and then put meiosis in the middle because we're going to talk about the boy meiosis. And then we're going to talk about the girl meiosis because it is a little different. And then we'll talk about the girls. So this is our bridge. Okay, so here's the deal. If you remember mitosis, mitosis, remember the whole cell life cycle where you've got most of the cell's life is spent in interphase, right? Because at the end of mitosis, you have two half-sized cells that have all the necessary parts, but they're half-sized, so they need to grow. So interphase is all about growth. And then you're going to get to a point in the life cycle of a cell where it hits that maximum size. And if it is mitotic, like it's an endothelial cell, then it looks at itself and it says, my surface to volume ratio is now inadequate for me to receive the nutrients I need and eliminate the waste I need. Okay, because remember, a <sighs> circumference is a squared product, whereas a volume is a cubed product. So in other words, it goes up a whole lot faster in volume than it does in surface area. So therefore we hit this maximum that is as big as we can get. Now we got to divide. So then we go through a little synthesis phase where we have to replicate our DNA. You remember this? And that's to line us up for the process of mitosis, which is IP on the mat. P-M-A-T, right? Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Everybody okay? All right. So during the process of getting ready to go into mitosis, I had to take all my DNA, all my chromosomes, had to stop working, so I had to condense up. And so from chromatin, all that loose thread stuff, I had to condense down and become these colored bodies, chromosomes, which is, that's what it means, a colored body. So it condensed down and then I had to replicate them. And that's why they ended up as being these X's because this is the same as this, these chromatids of the chromosomes, the two sides are identical, right? Because the whole point of mitosis is we line up everybody, single file in the middle, rip them apart, and then I've got two half-sized daughter cells that have absolutely all the same genetic information that the original cell had. I'm just half-sized, now I gotta grow again, okay? Sounds familiar? Okay. Meiosis is different. Meiosis has two stages to it. Meiosis, has first a pair up process. So here's the thing, is that when you look at your genes and we have 
46 chromosomes in a human cell, okay? Well, red blood cells don't have them because they ditched them all, but in a normal human cell, a body cell, you have 46 chromosomes. They are two pairs of chromosomes, okay? The pairs are one chromosome came from your mom, one chromosome came from your dad, right? So for instance, whatever color your eyes are, you got your mom's version, you got your dad's version. I have blue eyes. I have two parents who have blue eyes. All they had to contribute to my eye color options were blue from my mom or blue from my dad. So I got a blue from mom, a blue from dad. But what if I'd had a brown eyed mom and a blue eyed dad? Then I had kind of a mixture of possibilities, okay? So during meiosis, what happens is when I replicate my chromosomes and that's all the same, then I'm going to have to have my chromosomes that are from mom and dad for the same traits, they have to find each other. So if this right here is mom's, I'm gonna go down to here. If this right here in purple is mom's chromosome that has the information on eye color and what shape is your nose, then this over here, this green one right next to it is dad's version of what is your eye color and how big is your nose? Okay, so they find each other. And remember this strand is identical to this strand on the green, this strand is identical to this strand on the purple. But if right here at the tip is eye color on green, it's eye tip, 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 and tip for eye color. They all line up. We good? Okay. So in other words, I right here in this pair have four copies that determine eye color. Two are identical for mom and two are identical for dad. But there are four now of genes that say, what color will your eyes be? Okay, the process of having these homologous chromosomes, because that's what they're called. This is mom's and this is dad's. These are homologous chromosomes. During meiosis one, these homologous chromosomes find each other. The process of finding each other and coming together is called synapsis. Now that should sound familiar because remember the synapse is where the one neuron goes and joins up with the next thing that it's talking to, right? Where the neurotransmitters go across the synapse. So synapsis is two homologous chromosomes, one is mom's, one is dad's, comes together and forms a four-legged structure. So it's called a tetrad. Got it? So this is in prophase one of meiosis one. All right. So now here's what's happened. I got 23 pairs of chromosomes. So there are 23 of these tetrads that form in prophase one of meiosis. 23 pairs, okay? Now, what happens is when you look at these pairs and they've come together, a couple things could happen. One is they could do crossover and we'll get to that in just a minute, okay? Just depends. They might get really close to each other. But what'll happen is as the pairs are lined up, these strands of the spindle apparatus from these centrioles are going to come and anchor on to the centromeres of these pairs. So strands come over, grab onto the left side of this waist over here of this centromere of the dads. Over on the other side, we're grabbing onto the centromere of moms. And what'll happen, that's going to now start deconstructing and I end up with equal pull on both sides. So they start lining up in the middle. I now am in metaphase one of meiosis, but I'm in pairs instead of single file. Remember metaphase in mitosis, single file. Here, they're in pairs. We clear? Everybody good so far? Okay. If you've had biology already, this makes this easy. If you haven't, Work with me. Can I ask you, is this may, uh, mitosis for the cells uh, reproduction and meiosis for the sperm? Or sperm or and eggs. This sperm. is about making gametes. This is about any other cell. Okay, watch. Okay? Yeah. All right. Thanks. 
Okay. So anyway, so now when I'm pulling equally from opposite sides, now I line these up as I keep pulling apart during anaphase, right? Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. During anaphase, I'm going to now pull these guys apart so that I form two cells that have either mom's or dad's version of any trait that I need. Okay. But the thing is, I still have double, right? So if this is dad and this is blue eyes, then big nose, then I've got two blue eye, big nose genes because this is still replicated, it's still a double, right? Yes. Okay. This is mom's. This is brown eyes and little nose, little button nose. So, but there's still two of this. So that's still double what I have to have at the end. All right. So what'll happen is I've now divided. I'm going to go through another process that looks exactly like mitosis with half the number of chromosomes. Now I have 23 chromosomes instead of 46, and I'm going to go through it again and end up with four gametes in the end here in sperm production, each of which has either mom's or dad's version of everything, but only mom's or dad's, not both. So let's move on to a more detailed one, okay? So here we are, meiosis. In meiosis one, here we have the nuclear envelope has gone away. The centrioles have replicated. They start to move to opposite poles. The chromatin is condensed down. So now we see that sometimes these tetrads formed of synapses of homologous chromosomes, sometimes they actually cross over. This is where I desperately need somebody with me so that we can stand up with our big X formation with our legs apart and our arms apart and, and cross over. Because it's kind of like if you could picture if these were two people standing side by side, okay? And what happened was they swapped hands because as they came really close to each other in synapsis and formed these tetrads, sometimes they swap parts. And if they swap equal parts, they just make two new recombinant chromosomes. They still have all the things, but now this one has a little piece of mom and this one has a little piece of dad. Everybody see what I'm talking about? Okay, so the term for these, these chromosomes here is these are recombinant chromosomes because we have recombined. They are mostly moms with a little piece of dad or they're mostly dads with a little piece of mom, but they're new. They're recombinant. It's a way of increasing genetic diversity in the process of sexual reproduction. Okay. All right. So now prophase one, we did synapses, tetrad formation, crossover, made some recombinant chromosomes. Now the spindle apparatus grabbed onto the centromeres, starts to pull, lines them up in the middle, in pairs, we've got 23 pairs lined up at the metaphase plate in metaphase one. Anaphase, we start pulling and keeping on deconstructing, pulling them apart. So they make these little sloppy, scraggly things pulling to opposite poles. We get to the end of meiosis one and we're in telophase one. This is where we separate, okay? And cytokinesis is gonna cut. Now, if we were doing mitosis, then what we would end up with is these half size cells. And then we'd go back to the beginning and we would go through and make our full size cells. And we'd have two of those and they would go through the whole process again. But no, we're gonna make gametes. So as we make the gametes, meiosis two, these two new cells now only have either moms or dads. Of course, there are those little rogue recon recombined ones. Okay, but as a rule, I have either moms or dads. Now in this particular drawing that they did for you, we've got dad mostly on one side and mom mostly on another. But really, if you have 23 pairs, the likelihood of having one cell have all mom and all, another cell having all dad pretty low, right? Because you have to think, you know, how will you line up? You'll have mom on this side, dad on this side, and then dad on one, the 
same side and mom on the other side. So we keep swapping. So it's really random as to what team they end up on, moms or dads, because you never know in a tetrad which way, mom on the left, mom on the right, who knows? Okay, so it gives real variability in what the resulting cell at the end will have. Okay, so then we go through prophase two, metaphase two, by the way, there is no interphase between meiosis one and two, we go straight on. Okay, so you divide in half and keep on going. So prophase two, now instead of being tetrads, they are just regular old chromosomes. Looks like mitosis, but we only have half the number of chromosomes going through it. So now we go through metaphase two, lined up in the middle, start ripping. Now we've got our familiar Vs heading towards opposite poles. And then you end up with four resultant daughter cells. Each one of the daughter cells has either mom's or dad's version for every single trait we need in order to make another human, just one. Because remember the plan of a gamete, an egg or a sperm, is to go find the sperm of the egg. Well, the sperm are the ones who are doing the finding, honestly, the egg is waiting. So, but whatever the egg plus the sperm, when you put them together then should make another complete set where you've got a mom and a dad version of each particular trait. We good? Okay. So is it like a, um, for a 60, uh, uh, 66 chromosome, like, oh, no, no, 46 chromosomes uh, is still all the time. 23 from mom and 23 from dad. It's right, in a normal cell, in a full blown body cell. Now, when you are a gamete, you are haploid. Okay, so that's what I was about to get to. So let's go back to this one. Okay, so this is a normal body cell. Okay, so it has two versions of everything. And when it heads into the I'm going to divide, it's now got basically you've got the full 46 chromosomes 23 are from mom, 23 are from dad. But each is doubled. So I've got instead of 40, I've really got 92 <gasps> genes, right? Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. All right. So then what happens is this is called a diploid cell, your body cells, your liver cells, your skin cells, you know, your kidney cells, all of the cells that are not, you know, well, blood cells don't have anything except hemoglobin in them, but, um, and gametes, gametes are a, an anomaly in the cell chromosome contingent. So this is a diploid cell. Our body cells are diploid cells. In other words, they're two N. They've got mom and dad, so that makes two. This is still a diploid cell, two N. This is still a diploid cell, two N. These, as we now divide and head into this, these are haploid, one N, because they have either moms or dads. Despite the fact that they have double the genes that they need, they're still either mom or dad for most every single trait. The only exception are these little recombinant exceptions from crossover, okay? So this is now one N or haploid, half the normal number. Haploid, haploid. And when we divide up again into these four, these are still called haploid. You are either diploid or you are haploid. But these haploid cells have one gene, for every single protein instruction that we need in order to make another human. To make another human, you have to join this haploid sperm cell with a haploid oocyte so that you end up with a diploid cell to become another human. Okay, we good? Okay, all righty then. My office door is closed, so it's quiet in here and it's getting colder and colder and colder. My room is controlled by the patient room behind me. And if they're hot, they freeze me out. And evidently whoever's behind me right now is hot. Oh, so if my lips turn blue, I don't know. Can you see me? You can only see my screen right now, right? Oh, well. I can see you. Oh, you can't. My little, a, a gallery I'm, view can also see I'm a you. tiny little thing. Okay. Good, because that means that my gesticulations you can see. I wasn't sure. Okay. So anyway, this is trying to show you how you can get so much variability. And this is a wonderful thing 
about sexual reproduction is that it gives us a whole variety of possibilities, okay? Because I could have them line up this way at the metaphase plate, or I could have them line up this way at the metaphase plate. So when I split up, it results in very different possibilities. And think about, this is only with two pairs of chromosomes, but we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So the possibilities are really huge. And then you throw in recombinant and it really gets to be huge, the variability. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, cool beans. All right, so let's talk about the process of spermatogenesis then. Let's go to the guys, all right? Let's see. Ah, okay, so in your books, this is over on page uh, 1055 and 1056. So 1056 is really the one I want you to look at, okay? This stuff right here. What they've given here in this little picture up in the corner is scanning electron micrograph is um, kind of more of a 3D-ish looking thing. Instead of taking a thin section through, it shows you things more as sculptures. So this is really what it looks like when you look at a seminiferous tubule. All these little strands coming in are the flagella of the sperm, just as they're getting ready to be released into the lumen, okay? All right, so here. The process of making sperm. Spermatogenesis is the actual sperm formation, okay? And that makes sense. Spermatozoan formation is spermatogenesis. I'm generating sperm, okay? So what happens is when you look at the seminiferous tubule, and so I'm gonna to jump to this and back again, okay? So right here, when you look at the process, here are my diploid cells. A spermatogonium is a cell that is diploid and it's kind of like the sperm's version of the stem cell. This goes through mitosis. It is a mitotic cell. It is at the very outer edge of the seminiferous tubule. And honestly, when you're trying to identify the different cells in a uh, section of testis, it's a location, location, location thing. It's just as with the, um, like the adrenal cortex, right? It's all about the location. So spermatogonium is the stem cell. It's the diploid cell. It keeps going through mitosis, all right? It's going to, when it goes through mitosis, it makes two cells as you would expect. One cell stays behind. It's called the daughter cell A. The one that goes on through meiosis that's gonna become the four ultimately spermatozoa is just called the type B cell, the daughter cell B. So A stays behind, keeps making more A's and B's. B's move on. Be adventurous, move on. Okay, so the B daughter cell is going to now be the one who heads in to meiosis one. It is a diploid cell. It's going to undergo the whole synapsis, tetrad formation, the possible crossover, right? All of that good stuff is going to happen, this type B daughter cell. So then what happens is, as this is developing, the process literally physically moves it towards the lumen. So if I take a quick peek at this guy again, we're literally moving. It's an interesting thing. It's almost as if we stuck them on a conveyor belt. Normally, when we look at the eggs, we're gonna see whatever we do, we stay in one place. But in this case, we're actually being moved from the outer edge towards the lumen of the seminiferous tubule. Okay, good? All right, so now, before we move on, let me just talk a minute about how we can do that. It's because of these cells here, and I'll get more details in a minute, but these are called the sustentacular cells or Sertoli cells. They sustain the process of spermatogenesis. It is because of their support and their ability to respond to testosterone to make all this happen 
That's how this happens. Your seminiferous tubes are actually made up, the walls are made up of these sustentacular cells. And in between these sustentacular cells, this is where the process of spermatogenesis occurs. So if you kind of pictured two humans, and then in between you had all this spermatogenesis going on, the hands, the main hands of these humans would be the Sertoli cells, and then the little, all the little activities going on between them. So they're kind of holding on to each other to make the walls and allow all this stuff to happen. Okay. All right. So back to this one. So as we're moving through this process, when we are moving into meiosis one, we're called a primary spermatocyte. It still is diploid. It hasn't divided up yet. This is, I'm still in, I'm doing the prophase one, metaphase one. And then as I divide and finish up meiosis two, these are now called secondary spermatocytes. They are haploid. There's one, okay? We'll finish through this little piece and then I promise I'll let you go. So these secondary spermatocytes then are haploid, but they still have double the information. Now we become spermatids, okay? Everybody good? These spermatids are my end product. So a secondary spermatocyte becomes two spermatids. There are two secondary spermatocytes. These are four. This is what the end of meiosis showed you. These are those. Okay. Come here. I'm going to trap my cursor into the right place. Okay. So then all that has to happen is, and where we'll pick up on Tuesday, is that these spermatids each will evolve into a spermatozoan. And it takes a process that's going to be supported by these sustentacular cells because these now undergo metamorphosis. This is like looking at a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. Okay, pretty cool. Of course it's cool. We're not even finished being cool. Okay, so next week we're gonna pick up with what is it that we need in order to take our spermatids and make the sperm and let them loose, okay?